Hi guys, welcome back to the Misfit Independent Podcast. Today's episode is on taking risks. I've had so many people ask me in the past little while how I got to where I am, and not that I'm very far on my path, but I've definitely made some steps in the right direction. And I want to walk you guys through this very critical concept of how to embrace uncertainty and manage risk. I was recently interviewed for a podcast with Jonna White. It's called Leadership Conversations, and I'll post it when it's out. But it was tough being in the hot seat, being the one answering questions and not the one asking the questions. Having a podcast has taught me a lot about communication, especially how to communicate cohesively, how to reflect on what you want to say, how to make sure it's impactful and not just empty words that you're saying. And being on this podcast really gave me a chance to reflect on my career from my early start in entrepreneurship to my corporate career. And I don't know how much of it I've shared. I've definitely shared a little bit with you guys, but I've never shared it in kind of like a linear progression. So I want to do a bit of that today. I definitely talk a little bit about my businesses, but I've never talked about how I got from point A to point B and the mindset that comes with that. You guys know I've talked about Amazon FBA and that was kind of like my dip into entrepreneurship. But the way that I started I was 21. I was working at Bell. I just got my first full-time job. Alex, my partner, was a full-time entrepreneur selling on Amazon, made a full-time income off of this. So that's what kind of sparked the interest for me. We were also about to move in together. So we just came back from an exchange semester that we did in Prague. We had about we had about four months between when we came back from Prague and before we were going to move in for me to stay at home and kind of save up. And I'm super grateful that I had the opportunity to live at home with my parents, not have any living expenses and be able to save up for that kind of big move. I was also super fortunate to be able to land a great full-time job. So I had a pretty decent salary. I think I was making like 65,000 annually at the time, which for somebody coming out of school is huge. And I really started to see e-commerce taking off. I have a friend who got into e-commerce around the same time as Alex, and he started to build a course to teach people how to sell on Amazon. And this course started to absolutely take off, and he saw a wild amount of success from this. And that really sparked his career. He became an educator in the e-commerce space. But I saw this massive success that he was incurring. I saw Alex's brand do really well. And for Alex to be able to live off of that full time, I realized, you know what, I need to get into this. And it took me about six months from when I first initially had that idea to when I actually bit the bullet and ordered some inventory. And the key to taking risks, whether that's your career and investment, changing jobs, is that you have to be motivated. And I know myself quite well. I know that I'm motivated financially. That's why I built my corporate career working in tech sales. So I knew that I was motivated and ready to take on a new opportunity. So the first tip for learning how to take risks is that you have to be motivated and you have to know what that motivation is. You need to know your why. So for me, when I was first starting my Amazon business, I saw the time freedom that that allowed. You would be in control of your day. You had the ability to wake up whenever you wanted. You weren't answering to anybody. You had ultimate freedom of your time. I'm sure many of you guys have had an idea or thought, do I put on my horse blinders and take a risk? Or do I scrap what I have and restart? See, men are more inclined to take risks than women. And it has a lot to do with the levels of testosterone in the body. But that doesn't mean that women can't take risks. There's a lot of studies that show that men will take more risks under pressure. Whereas when women are under pressure, risk-taking tends to decrease under stress. And because women are considered more risk-averse, they're actually at a disadvantage when it comes to getting support for risk-taking. And that's why, unfortunately, there are fewer female-run businesses that are funded by VC. So how do we break this mold? Well, first, we become comfortable with taking risk. And I want to speak about uncertainty first. Life life is pretty uncertain. There's always going to be things that are outside of your control that are going to impact you. So you want to learn how to control what you can control. And being able to take risks, taking action, being open to opportunities, these are all things that are within your control. Sure, things may happen, like COVID, for example, in the pandemic, nobody saw that coming. But as long as you're able to do the things that are within your control and do them properly, you're going to succeed. 
So the first step in learning how to take risks is to start small. Start small so that you can learn the ropes, test, and adjust as you need. Back in 2017, when I launched my first venture, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I didn't have this like groundbreaking idea. I was super curious about e-commerce and being an Amazon consumer, I was really curious about how and why people buy things online. I started watching trends, specifically in beauty, and I looked at things like Google Trends, search volume, to see where there were opportunities for me to create a product-based business. What I was doing with Google Trends and keywords is I was looking to see if there were search volume increases and if that was constant year-round or if it was seasonal and what products and what categories were starting to see an uptick in interest. And I did this for about six months before I committed to a specific product. And I was looking at all kinds of things, like I was looking at flyaway tamers for hair. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, but it's kind of like a little mascara stick that you use just to tame your flyaways. Another product that I looked at was cooling patches for women with menopause. And finally, I just decided to pick something. I knew that this was going to be a test. I knew very little about what it took to actually run a business at that point, but I knew I wanted to try. And it was a test, but it was definitely an expensive test. I treated this like an experiment. I didn't treat this like a get-rich-quick scheme. And with my $65,000 salary, I managed to put away $7,000 for entrepreneurship, which is just over 10%, close to 11% of my salary at the time, pre-tax, which is pretty significant. I started small, right? I didn't go into like this new SaaS or software as a service business where I was building an app and I needed a team. I was building something very small that I could do myself on the side. So essentially, I was dipping my toes into entrepreneurship. And that's something that I really suggest as well. If a side hustle or a business idea or even investing is something that you want to do, dip your toes in before you just dive head first. So if there's a risk that you want to take, think about the smallest version of that that you can do and do that today. The whole idea of like taking risks reminds me of cliff jumping as a kid. So when I was a kid, we used to go to Kilbear Provincial Park every summer. And it was amazing. I used to look forward to this like every year. I love camping to this day. But at Kilbera, there is these set of cliffs at Harold's Point. And everybody every year will go cliff jumping. There's like some specific spots. And the cliffs kind of go up in elevation. So when I was a kid, I would watch people jump off of the craziest cliffs. And there's the top one is actually called suicide. And you have to jump over everybody else. So it's a, it's a very intense uh, cliff. But I would look at that and think there's no way in hell I'm doing that. And I would start from the very bottom and I would work my way up and it would kind of be like a game. And that's literally what entrepreneurship is. Some people have the guts and the balls to go right off of suicide. Like Alex, for example. Alex, my partner, did that jump one year. I think uh, I watched him absolutely terrified. I've got a better sense of self-preservation, I'd say. Um, So I've never done it. But there's some people that do. And if you want to learn how to take risks, you start from the very bottom. You can apply this to investing too. If you want to start investing or start investing into a particular asset class, for example, start small, right? One thing that I did recently, and I've been talking about this, is I've been consistently averaging down or consistently buying stocks even throughout this period, even if we're in or moving towards a recession. And part of the reason why is I think that a lot of these major companies are on sale right now. They've dipped down over 30% to what they were at the start of the year. Some of that might be because they have had, you know, overvalued valuations, but they're still seeing a substantial amount of growth. They're still profitable companies. So I see future growth. And I think at this point, I'm just buying the companies at a discount, but I don't know where that bottom is. So I've been averaging down or slowly buying um, shares. And with Well Simple, you can actually buy fractional shares. So let's say you wanted to buy a share of Amazon. You don't need to buy the whole thing. I can buy a tenth of it. And there's no transaction fees. So I'm not spending $10 every time I'm making this transaction. I can buy a little bit at a time. And I like to call that nibbling. So I'm nibbling away at these positions. And you can apply that same method to any kind of risk that you want to take. Right? You want to make a career move. Instead of going all in and quitting your job right away, You can start applying for roles, start to look at companies that you want to work for, start to um, incrementally do research, and all of that adds up. And then eventually, when you're ready to jump off of the big cliff and resign, likely you'd have something already lined up. And if you don't use Wealth Simple yet, you can check out the link in my bio. I have a code that will get you $50 off or $50 of free stock when you sign up. So go check that out. Tip number two. 
when you're taking risks is to know your business in and out or know the situation in and out. So that first business failed because I was in an incredibly saturated market and I was competing against some of the top beauty producers. So for them, for a company like Saint-Tropez, which is um, a very big brand in the self-tanning space, it took literally no effort for them to replicate exactly what I'd done. There was no innovation. There was no groundbreaking patented concept. So what I did is I had to divest. I sold off the remaining inventory. I had about 700 units that were unsold that I had to get rid of essentially and sell at a discount. I ended up selling them to um, overstock for a massive, massive discount. And with that $7,000 initial investment, I was able to recoup $2,000. So in total, I lost just about $5,000 on that venture. In business, you're either creating a market or you're going after somebody's existing market share. Know which strategy you're after. And if you're stealing market share, know how much you want to take and how much is feasible for you to take. And that applies to like a career move as well. If you know you want to make a career move, know what opportunities are out there that you're qualified for. Know if you want to level up your your career and you want to go for a promotion or a, a different title, what skill sets you're missing and what you need to supplement and learn on the side. Okay, tip number three, this is pretty critical. It's find a partner. The next business that I started was an agility training kit. I knew with this one that I needed to deliver some sort of value that nobody else could. So I built an ebook. It was like a 70 page ebook with drills and training exercises for coaches and for people that were looking to use this equipment. The MVP or the minimum viable product for something like this was a lot more expensive to manufacture. There were multiple components involved And we needed to actually work with multiple different manufacturers because a parachute, for example, was manufactured at a different place than resistance bands or uh, an agility ladder. So all of these pieces were manufactured at different factories and we needed to be able to bring them all together. So the cost of that investment was substantially higher. And that's where having business partners makes a big difference because they're able to financially be involved with you. I actually remember the first day that we sent the PI bank transfer to the manufacturer and it was a wire the total that we had spent on that first order was eighty thousand. and when you're buying inventory you don't need to pay all of that up front so you're paying it uh usually within two portions you pay a deposit and then you pay the remainder but i remember seeing that and, and thinking that was crazy and i remember even physically shaking from the fear of of you know a little bit being afraid of losing that money but i did know that i was taking that risk not alone I was betting on myself. I was betting on the partnership. I had learned an immense amount from that first venture. So I knew that I was taking a calculated risk and I was moving on to a bigger cliff. But the thing is, I had absolute trust that it was going to be okay. And the thing with jumping off of that cliff is that you don't usually jump first. You you stop. You wait. You watch somebody else jump. You know that it's safe. And then you go. So that's that was kind of the strategy here. I'd seen... Other people see massive success in e-commerce, and I knew that it was possible for me as well. I just need to do it properly and avoid the rocks that were at the bottom. You know, jump strategically into an area where I was avoiding rocks. So I remember the first order that I put in was $7,000 that I'd spent on inventory. I did lose five, but I'd spent the next six months. I got a new job. I doubled my employment income, which was huge for me. And I was actually able to set aside $20,000. I needed 26 total in order to make both payments um, for that inventory order. And I needed 6000 So what I did was I asked Alex if I could borrow that from him. And then I'd spent the remaining uh, next couple of months paying him back for it. So I was super grateful to have a partner that was able to not just be my, my life partner, but also to be able to go into business with and for him to support me as well. So he put up a larger portion of that that inventory order, which I was super grateful for. The thing with that risk was now there was a larger sum of money on the line, right? There was $20,000 of my own money, but there was also $6,000 that I'd borrowed from Alex. So my level of responsibility had changed. And, you know, sometimes you'll be in situations where you make an investment and you're using money from a line, for example, like a HELOC or just any line of credit, or you're getting a mortgage and you're worried about not being able to pay that back. But I want you to think about the fact that that partner or that institution 
gave you that money for a reason, right? They trust you to pay it back. They think that you're a worthy borrower. So you need to do everything in your power to be able to execute that properly. Now with real estate, there are things that can be outside of your control. The market might change. There are all sorts of different factors that affect the real estate market. With a business, you have the power to be able to drive more sales to the business. And there are so many different things that you can do. There is always a way out of a tough situation unless you've just chosen to be in the wrong business entirely. And we'll talk about that. So how how did I know that this was going to work? And this is where tip number three comes in. And this is fear setting. I actually learned this from Tim Ferriss. And it's basically a structured reflection exercise. So you take three blank pages and then you title them. Define, prevent, and repair. Define is where you list out what is the worst possible scenario that can happen. What might go wrong? Prevent is how do you reduce the likelihood of that scenario from happening? And repair is what can you do to repair the damage and get back on track? And then you assess the impact, one for minimal impact to 10 being absolutely life-altering. You also want to look at the cost of inaction. What do I lose out on if I don't take adequate action? So the key with fear setting is you want to find clarity, you want to conquer fear, and then you want to take action. That last bit is the absolute key. So when I did this exercise, first we defined the problem. The problem was that fitness is seasonal. So I was worried that, you know, even though we were able to make sales in, let's say, November and December, that in the summer months that we would have a dip in sales. So what that exercise looked at, knowing that that was what the problem was, is we knew that we needed to absolutely go very hard in December, in the winter months, especially when January comes around and everybody starts talking about fitness and their new lifestyle. And we knew that sales were going to dip. So we needed to be more skewed and have more inventory on hand for the winter months. We did some sales projections. We knew what the slower months would look like. And we knew that we needed to launch in the winter. So we actually ended up launching November 23rd, 2018. And the day that we launched the day that we had all our inventory in the Amazon warehouses ready to go. I remember we went out for sushi to celebrate and I got a fortune cookie, which doesn't usually happen when you go out for sushi, but this was a new place that we were trying. So I got a fortune cookie and in the, in the fortune cookie, the, the quote that was on there said, your business will be prosperous. And to this day, I carry that in my wallet and I think about that. And I feel like that was a sign from the universe. And you know what, maybe it wasn't the universe, but I'd like to think that it was. And where your attention goes, energy flows. I'm a firm believer that thoughts become things. So if I focus on that fortune cookie, I know that it told me my business will be prosperous. I think about that to this day. And I think about what do I need to do in order to make that happen? How do I take action so that my business is prosperous? Okay, tip number four is managing uncertainty. Intuition takes time to build, and I think it's a mix between confidence and experience. And the number one thing that intuition can help you with is knowing when to quit. So taking risks is important. It opens up doors for you. It creates opportunity. But sometimes you take risks and you pursue something that may not be the right opportunity for you. So you need to know when to quit. And knowing when to quit involves taking a risk as well. And what people don't realize is that winners quit all the time. They just quit at the right stuff. What they do is they actually quit the right thing at the right time. Sometimes I think about those Dragon's Den businesses where people come in to pitch and they say that they've spent 200,000 or a million dollars of their own money into an absolute bogus idea like water balloons. And I think to myself, at what point did this person not realize that this was a dumb idea and why didn't they stop? Why didn't they quit at the right time? And with almost every business, There are curves and trajectories that you follow. So one is a very famous one. Um, Seth Godin actually wrote a book about this called The Dip. And everything in life is actually controlled by this dip, supposedly. So when you start learning something, right, it's fun, it's exciting. During the next few weeks, the rapid learning keeps you going. And the dip is this point where you're between learning and mastery. So you get to a point where it's exciting, you know, you keep going, and then it gets boring. And that period is actually a shortcut because if you can make it through that dip, you 10x. And the dip gets you to a point where you want to go faster than at any other point. So once you get past that boring period, 
and you want to reach mastery, you absolutely run towards that point. So that's what the dip curve is. That's kind of like what it looks like visually. And COVID was really a situation like that that forced us to be resilient. We felt the effects of COVID in 2019, just around the end of 2019, like November, December, when shipping prices started to skyrocket. And we knew that, you know, this COVID, or at that point, we didn't even know it was called COVID. At that point, we called it coronavirus. That was a quick little TBT. So we knew that this was going to be serious. This was going to affect inventory in our factories and our manufacturing significantly. So we had to order and hold more inventory on hand. And that was actually the biggest blessing in disguise because when you have more inventory, you need to sell it in order to have money to order more inventory. So that was kind of like a fire that we'd started artificially under our bums to keep going. And that's where we experienced that dip curve. But we eventually exited that that business. Um, We actually tried to sell it to our warehouse or a logistics partner and the deal kind of fell through. So we just, um, we fully exited. We didn't order any more inventory. We made about $50,000 in profit off of that business. And then we reinvested that into new ventures. So I don't want to talk too much about some of the new things and the new e-commerce businesses. Um, Not so much about like the details of what the business is, but I do want to share what I've learned from all of these different curves and knowing when to quit the right thing. So with this new business that I'm working on, it's not a baby anymore. Uh, It's more of a toddler. It's been around for about three years now. We've seen so many supply chain and inventory issues come up. And we had the opportunity to start to move away from the B2C space or business to consumer, direct to consumer space, and move more into selling directly to businesses. So what I did was I hired and I built a sales team. And here's how that turned out. The biggest lesson that I learned is that if you want to have self-sufficient people in your business that you can rely on fully, you need to hire people that are highly skilled. And as a startup or as an early business, it's tough because often you don't have the money to be able to afford salaries. So what I would highly recommend is to go out if you don't have the money for it, to get funding, to get support. Um, But having people that are smarter than you, that are able to execute on things that you can't is critical. So that sales team completely failed because I was investing a lot of my own resources into coaching, into training people that didn't have the necessary skill set. They did, they had the potential, but I didn't have the ability or the time to be able to train each person individually. So I learned the hard way that you either hire experienced people or you give up a lot of your resources to train and bring people up to speed. So that was the dip for me. It was a dip in sales that made me realize that we have the wrong strategy and wrong approach entirely. The next type of curve is the cul-de-sac. And the cul-de-sac is a French word for dead end. And a cul-de-sac, if you were to visualize it, is literally just like this. So it's a common curve. It's boring. And it leads you nowhere. It doesn't get you to a dip. And often it leads to failure. And you get this general sense of meh. Because you feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again and not getting any results. If you feel like this is where you're at with your job, where you've been going for a promotion over and over and over again and you're not getting it, it's time to quit. And I'm not necessarily talking about adversity here. Adversity is your ally. The harder it gets to do something, the more difficult it becomes for your competition to do something as well. And so as you move past that adversity, you actually pad yourself with protection from your competitor and you insulate yourself from your competitor. Now, if if you quit the wrong thing at the wrong time, all of that adversity was for nothing. So if adversity causes you to quit, it was for nothing. Adversity can be a good thing. Adversity and getting past adversity is what causes you to move past towards a dip curve. And if it's a dip, that's a good thing. Now, if it's a cliff, which is the third type of curve, That is a situation that you want to avoid. So a cliff is a curve that you move towards and then it drops. So a cliff is something that you work towards and then all of a sudden you can't get off of the curve until you quit and things fall apart. These are businesses that don't have a lot of opportunity and they perform incrementally well until they don't. So this was the agility kit for us. It was a seasonal business and we knew this. But what we did is we went through this period of growth because we launched and we ran this business for over a year, but we launched at a point where 
it was doing very well in the winter months. And then in the summer, we would see a slowdown in sales. And so we knew that the only way to end it would be to order enough inventory to run through another cycle to sell out, to make a good amount of profit that we could then stop and reinvest into something else. If you want to start a side hustle, if you want to start a business, I want you to think about that cliff and think about the fact that you need to prepare to be on it because if it's a successful venture, you will go through it. Otherwise, you're just going to fall off if it's a cliff or it's going to become a cul-de-sac where you get bored and move on. The simple rule is that if you can't make it out of the dip, don't start. And there's seven reasons why you might fail. You run out of money and quit. You run out of time and quit. You get scared and quit. You're not serious about it. You lose interest or enthusiasm and settle for being mediocre. You focus on the short term and you picked the wrong thing to be the best in the world at. What do you want to be the best in the world at? What do you want to build? Start small. Do it bit by bit. And think about the fact that fear doesn't exist anywhere except in the mind. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode today. It's a little bit different from what I usually do, but I want to focus more on the mindset piece and the podcast episode that I recorded just made me reflect about my own journey and I want to bring in more elements, more stories to share some of that with you guys. So I hope you enjoyed. It would mean the world to me if you could leave me a review wherever you're listening. And if you're listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube, please leave me a comment and subscribe to my channel. See you guys next week.